serve two smarter ventilation. My name is Ben Newell from Build Equinox. I'm uh, president, and today we'll be going through the serve two uh, overview, just kind of um, looking at the system overall. This uh, historically had been kind of a comparison of our first generation serve to the serve two, but now that it's been on the market for uh, coming up on a year now, uh, this later this spring. Uh, that we're morphing it more into just an overview of the serve two, so there won't be much uh, discussion about our first generation unit, uh, just on what uh, looking forward with uh, the serve two now. Uh, this slide just shows some of the um, overall features that we uh, market with the the serve two, uh, just the automatic fresh air control, uh, ventilation, recirculation modes, heat pump variable speed, uh, controls, and internet connectivity, designed and built in the USA. So these are all features that we'll kind of uh, touch on as we move through the uh, presentation. Uh, more in depth um, outline here, if I can advance my slides. This outline here is more in depth, uh, just talking, first of all, about what smart ventilation is and uh, uh, just going over that uh, standards, current air uh, quality standards, configuration of the serve to installation, operation performance uh, characteristics, and then additional features or options that are built into it, uh, some future tech and availability. Uh, as you have questions, feel free to submit those and I will periodically uh, stop and try to answer those if I can. And then if we have time at the end, uh, happy to answer uh, additional questions as well. <clears throat> so first, uh, kind of looking at the current standards for ventilation, most of you uh, are probably familiar or have heard of ASHRAE 62.2 which is the standard for uh, ventilation in residential buildings. And it's what this is is a minimum standard, it, but it's not based on indoor air quality. It's not an air quality standard uh, for inside a home. Uh, it's uh, historically based on odor detection uh, studies. So uh, generally those are gonna, if you look at that versus what actual air quality is uh, and keeping people healthy and minimizing health effects, uh, that basing it on odor isn't sufficient for, for maintaining a good air quality. Uh, it also doesn't account for higher pollution events or changes in occupancy or activity levels. Gas and electric uh, are um, looked at uh, in the same way. There's no penalty for using gas or uh, combustion appliances inside. And then, uh, as I mentioned, the new studies are showing that uh, the airflows uh, specified in the standard are not sufficient for uh, managing uh, healthy air inside the home. So that's what we're really pushing for with the CERV is a ventilation uh, system that's going above uh, just the standard uh, code. Now, smart ventilation specifically then measures pollutants and other comfort conditions, and it makes operational decisions based on uh, data that it's collecting, uh, and then also the set points uh, by the users or occupants. The, it's important to shift towards this kind of control because uh, things you aren't measuring, you can't accurately control. It's try, like trying to drive your car without a speedometer. Uh, there may be a setting that you think you should set it to, but if you're just guessing based on looking at how fast you think you're going, you're not going to be going the right speed. As well as not knowing uh, what's going on your, around you um, in terms of uh, occupancy uh, changes and activity levels, uh, what's going on in the house. It's a very dynamic environment. You have cooking, showering, uh, things like this going on, exercise versus more sedentary activities. These things all change the amount of fresh air that you need in a home. And uh, if you can't vary the level of ventilation and uh, trigger it when you need to, uh, you're not able to uh, accurately um, keep it at that level and ensure a healthy environment. 
And then it also saves energy. And so we're really trying to shift the focus from just saying which system is more energy efficient to really looking at which systems can keep your home uh, at a healthy indoor air quality level. And that's much more important than the uh, minimal amount of energy and cost associated with operation rather than uh, the health effects. Now the surf smart ventilation then we uh, measure temperature, relative humidity, CO2, VOC levels, and then we can automatically uh, make changes in the operation based on uh, these readings as well as the set points. Um, while you may associate then uh, being able to smell pollutants, uh, determining when you may need ventilation, uh, the sensors built into the serve, the independent CO2 VOC sensors are highly sensitive and will pick pollutant levels up much sooner than you should be able to detect just by odors or comfort levels. And then um, by measuring things, you can automatically adjust for uh, like things like infiltration in a home, uh, opening doors and windows. So a home with a lot of kids going inside and outside of the house, that's fresh air coming in that may uh, reduce the amount of ventilation that the mechanical system needs to do. Likewise, while we don't view infiltration really as uh, healthy fresh air, it's not necessarily coming in where you want it to and then it's not filtered, but this will reduce uh, pollutant levels, CO2, VOCs. And so a leaky house uh, may need less ventilation than a tighter home. Um, also then uh, depending on conditions outside, a windier day, uh, winter versus summer, that all changes your infiltration rate and the serve can automatically adjust for that because it's measuring pollutant levels. And then we can also use metrics um, to provide feedback to the users, kind of home health reports, uh, because we are collecting this data over time. We can give that feedback uh, to the occupants, say, here's how your house has been performing, and that's helpful as well. Do they need to make changes in their settings with the system or things they're doing, activities or products or things uh, in the house, uh, really uh, giving them more control and, and feedback on what's going on. This is just an example of just a conventional uh, ERV ventilation system versus then a serve uh, smart ventilation type system. Uh, the first uh, chart shows this is a high performance uh, passive house just with continuous ventilation set to levels where uh, they think it should be set to. The first part of the chart where it's higher levels, that's when the um, occupants were home, just regular daily activities. And you can see it's above that roughly 700 to 1,000 uh, threshold where you want to maintain uh, good air quality. When they leave, uh, then the system's still running. This is over a weekend and they were out of the house. Uh, you can see that's a time when they have really good air quality uh, levels in the home. But obviously the system's just running flat out, still ventilating, uh, using energy uh, that isn't needed. And then when they come back again, the levels uh, go back over uh, this threshold. On average then, the, if you just average this over the time period, it would look like it is really good air quality. But then looking at the, the actual data, you see that when it is occupied, it's higher than you'd like. You should probably set it higher. And when they're gone, you can really cut down the amount of ventilation that it's doing. The serve then uh, below shows how it reacts to uh, pollutant levels. Uh, so the CO2 and uh, VOC uh, charts here with uh, the green background shows uh, periods of ventilation. Uh, so to the left of the chart, you see where there's no ventilation going on. The CO2 finally hits a threshold to activate uh, ventilation. Um, CO2 then is brought down uh, under the set point. And then you have a few other uh, places where it's hitting that set point again, triggering ventilation. This might be a high occupancy um, level. Maybe they have people over uh, in the house. So the serve is right up against uh, the set point. And then perhaps uh, the guests went away from the house and now the CO2 and VOC levels uh, drop down below uh, the setting, thus uh, shutting off uh, ventilation needed once again. 
And how, so how does smart ventilation then kind of impact the, the home overall? Um, homeowners, builders, architects, different stakeholders in a project, um, they build homes with different certifications, either Passive House or LEED or Net Zero, Energy Star, uh, because they know these homes uh, will have increased comfort, increased energy efficiency, durability, uh, perhaps lower life cycle cost, hopefully, and they're more marketable. Smart ventilation then is really a good fit for these types of homes, especially where you're exceeding code by quite a bit uh, with certain features for those reasons. But then generally they're just following uh, the standard baseline ASHRAE code for ventilation. Smart ventilation then lets them uh, have a high performance ventilation system to match their, uh, their home. And so it really improves on all the above things, plus improving the health of the occupants uh, by way of cognition, productivity, sleep quality increases. And then by um, taking data, you have proof what your home is, uh, what the air quality is inside, and that it can maintain excellent air quality. You're starting to see a lot of uh, realtors and uh, potential home buyers request radon, um, uh, radon readings for a house, as well as perhaps utility bills. Uh, so it's not too far in the future where then you may see people saying, hey, I want to see uh, how how the air quality is maintained in this house. And that's something you can do with uh, the CERV as a smart ventilation system with that kind of data. Looks like a question may have popped up about that. Uh, someone's asking about just kind of doing a baseline uh, as far as uh, taking CO2 monitoring. Uh, you can for sure uh, buy these online. The inexpensive ones are not uh, very trustworthy, but they can kind of maybe give you an indication. Um, with the CERV, there's not really a home. People say, oh, my house is old and leaky. Uh, but the studies we've done and seen, that isn't an indication that you have good air quality. Just construction flaws in the house, um, where those leaks are occurring aren't necessarily where people are occupying the house. They may be all in a crawl space and basement, uh, giving you a very leaky house. Uh, but then maybe it's uh, fairly well sealed without much air movement through the living and bedroom areas uh, where you may have really high pollutant levels. So the type of house isn't too important uh, to uh, installing a serve. Uh, so the, and then uh, someone else asked where the sensors are located in the serve. Uh, they're located in the serve. So it's looking at the house as a whole. We have wireless remote sensors that can be used as well uh, to look at different areas of the home. Uh, but the serve is uh, really ducted throughout the house, uh, bringing that air centrally to it, where it's taking these readings and then trying to maintain the whole house uh, at a uniform uh, air quality and comfort level. And then uh, this is something where we do have wireless uh, remote sensors right now but that's something we'll continue to expand on. The, the CERV2 is a good base for, for doing that to looking at um, specific ventilation uh, or air quality in different uh, locations. This is just a perspective of the energy versus health uh, costs. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of these certification programs are really focused on the energy and that we're building high performance homes to save energy, where we're really focused on you really build a house to keep yourself comfortable and as healthy as possible. And that having better health associated with better air quality in a home is really uh, on par, if not greatly exceeding uh, the cost of energy. If we assume uh, 100 million high performance uh, homes across the US, uh, it would cost about $160 billion a year uh, to, um, to condition these uh, homes, power these homes, about 4,000 kilowatt hours uh, per person a year, 12 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, come up with about 160 billion. Just the annual cost of influenza uh, 
throughout the United States per year is 87 billion. So half the energy costs for high performance homes throughout the country, um, half of that uh, is the cost of just influenza. In uh, ventilation, increased ventilation during uh, times of influenza can uh, reduce uh, contamination and uh, spreading of the flu. And so there's a direct uh, cost savings benefit uh, to having a good ventilation and air quality. Asthma uh, is becoming more prevalent. Um, you probably know someone if uh, you yourself or your family member uh, aren't afflicted with it. It's now up to 10% of the population. So a third of the households uh, have uh, asthma. And uh, this has a cost of uh, $56 billion uh, per year. And so can we reduce that where, uh, down to where historically it has been 5% or even less? Uh, most likely people are just spending more time in their house. Um, the products, houses are becoming more well sealed. Uh, the products and furnishings uh, that we build our house, houses from. Uh, these are all things that are pointing towards uh, this increase in asthma levels. So with uh, good ventilation and air quality, it's something that hopefully we can control and hopefully reduce uh, even lower uh, historic levels. And then there's also the productivity. This is a harder thing to quantify, uh, but there's a hangover effect. If you spend uh, your time at home in a high CO2 environment, going to work the next day, uh, you have a lower productivity uh, cognition. Uh, this is uh, directly related to how product productive you are at work. So uh, how much is that costing you? A $50,000 a year job, just a 1% loss in productivity is $500 a year. Uh, studies are showing that 10% productivity loss isn't, uh, wouldn't be that surprising. So this is a pretty uh, big effect compared to how much you may spend on energy in a year, just a few thousand dollars. Just uh, check in on the questions here, um, see if there's anything. Um, some of these are uh, kind of related, looks like to what I'll be going over. Uh, a bit later here, so I'll just uh, continue on and may answer these questions. The uh, configuration then of the serve 2 it's a unitary system, so it's all in one. The uh, energy recovery in the CERV is uh, done uh, through a heat pump, so there's no ERV or HRV core in the system. It's all through a heat pump. Uh, dampers are built in as well. The fans are ECM, so they're super efficient, variable speed. Uh, so we can do balancing with those as well as setting the airflow rate for different times of operation. Uh, fresh air uh, and return air filters are built into the unit. These are standard 10 by 20 uh, by one inch or two inch filters can be used. So trying to, um, uh, trying to just have a low cost for filter changes to encourage people to do this. Uh, filtration is an important part of uh, good air quality. Uh, the display is a built-in uh, color touchscreen, and then the, the housing is unpainted aluminum and 8-inch uh, duct connections on the unit, uh, just uh, keeping big passage, passageways through the unit to reduce the fan power and any noise associated with that. Uh, that's the reason for these uh, larger uh, duct connections. And then the serve 2 has expanded uh, external input-output uh, capabilities, and we'll go over some of that as well. <clears throat> A few of the uh, just uh, bullet points on the heat pump system. Uh, it's a variable speed compressor, so we, have, we can change the uh, capacity uh, based on uh, the modes of operation and conditions inside and outside. Uh, the compressor is from uh, the appliance industry, so it's like a larger refrigerator-based uh, compressor, uh, both uh, for efficiency as well as uh, uh, noise purposes, so it's virtually a uh, silent system. We use electronic expansion valve. This also lets us vary the capacity uh, of the system as well as the efficiency, so we can tune it to different conditions. <clears throat> and then we use uh, microchannel heat exchangers, so these are 
uh, very lightweight and uh, reduce the refrigerant charge uh, and then they're recyclable. Uh, we try to keep end of life uh, in mind when we design our system. Uh, the previous slide showed that the, the housing is also unpainted aluminum, gives it a nice look, but also makes it more recyclable, eliminating paint. Configuration of the system overall, uh, mentioned the eight inch ducts. Uh, all the duct connections come from the top. Uh, it's kind of in a vertical orientation. The uh, two back uh, ducts are the um, outlets from the fan. So you have the supply duct into the house, the exhaust duct to the outside. And then on the right side there, more towards the front are the fresh air uh, from outside and then a return duct uh, coming from the house. So these four ports are standard like any other ERV or HRV type of system. Uh, unique feature are these utility ducts. These are smaller three inch ones. Uh, these would be ducted or just left open if uh, for like a heat pump water heater or heat pump clothes dryer. Uh, those two appliances will either uh, cool down or heat up a space. So while you wouldn't duck them directly to the serve, you can uh, pull air from those locations uh, into the serve. It's offset from the uh, temperature humidity um, sensors we have built in just if those rooms are uh, a bit warmer or cooler, just so it won't influence the overall um, uh, readings from the house there, but that entrains that air to help keep those spaces uh, uh, more uniform uh, temperature so those appliances can operate more efficiently. The filter access panels from the top, so those 10 by 20 inch filters uh, are sitting side by side in there and they just slide down in. Um, condensate drain, um, it is an ERV, so we are dropping moisture out uh, through the heat pump cycle, uh, both condensate as well as frost. Uh, so there's a condensate uh, line that comes out. Uh, a power switch, the unit just plugs into a standard 120 outlet. Uh, recommend just a 15 amp breaker uh, for that uh, outlet circuit. And then there's some knockouts for auxiliary uh, wired input or outputs that uh, can connect to the serve that way. The screen is uh, built into the unit, so it's a capacitive touch, uh, three and a half inch uh, screen. I'm trying to keep it large, clear, and easy to navigate. Uh, some of you are familiar with other ERV systems, it's either just the dial you're setting, or if it is a screen, it's pretty rudimentary and there's a lot of levels to uh, doing the settings. So we wanted to make it as intuitive and easy to navigate as possible so you can't get lost in the settings or don't know what's going on. Um, and then we have wireless uh, dedicated screen as well. So uh, this can be placed around the house and it's just communicating wirelessly with the serve so you can uh, see the current, um, see the current uh, settings and data and make changes if you need to. Um, I'll go over a little bit more, just the wire Wi-Fi capability too is built in. So that's a reason the remote screen is now optional, uh, that we're trying to push people more towards using the online with smartphone or tablet or computer. Uh, you have the same controller as you do built into it. So you can control it from anywhere in your house or anywhere in the world online. <clears throat> as far as the installation, you really just uh, set the unit in place, uh, connect the ducts, plug it into an outlet, connect the condensate drain, either run it to a floor drain, or it can go to a condensate pump to, to send it condensate elsewhere. The, uh, the size of the unit is roughly two feet wide and then front to back, uh, 40 inches, and then the height is just about 38. The filter access, uh, the minimum area shown vertically, that's really if you didn't have any clearance on the side. Um, if you wanted to have a shorter uh, install area above it, uh, the filters can come out more horizontally. Uh, you just need uh, enough room to connect the ducts from above. Um, the surf can either, most likely is setting just on the floor uh, or uh, some people build uh, just a platform so you can have, maintain storage uh, below the unit as well. You, know, you really wanna have a good you know, ease of access to change the filters every 
at least three months, if not uh, more than that. This is just a picture of a uh, typical installation. This is uh, in a mechanical room. Uh, so you can see the ducts just coming straight off of the unit. The, uh, the back uh, left duct is the supply to the house. So that in this case is uninsulated, but that can be uh, have some level of insulation if you wanna maintain uh, the condition from the serve uh, going to uh, different uh, supply locations in the house. The uh, back right duct is the exhaust uh, to the outside. So you can see that uh, very well insulated as it needs to be. The fresh air from outside is just in front of that. It's uh, harder to see in this uh, picture here, but uh, that's also well insulate, insulated. We recommend at least an R8, uh, but this will depend on uh, your location. Uh, you may need less, you may need more than that, just to prevent any sweating, uh, condensation, frost buildup on the outside of these ducts. And then the uh, return air uh, from the house, as long as all those ducts are uh, within condition space, uh, this can just be uninsulated coming back to the unit. Uh, in the case of this installation, you can see those utility ducts are uh, just capped off. So uh, they're not using those and that um, would be typical for most uh, uh, installations. Uh, some where they have a heat pump water heater in the same room as the serve, either there's a direct return in that room or uh, these utility ducts, uh, they may just drill a few holes in that cap to entrain some air to come uh, from that room, uh, just uh, a few CFM to, to come through that space. You can't see the unit plugged in uh, in the back is where the cord is. And then uh, on the front is just a condensate drain. This one's just gravity. Uh, going back to a floor drain behind the unit. Maintenance wise, um, really changing the filters, as I mentioned, is the most important aspect of maintaining the unit. Uh, besides that, uh, making sure the condensate drain uh, is flowing freely like you would with your air conditioner. And then uh, something else that's important is uh, to keep the ports on the outside of the house clear. So. Uh, the fresh air intake as well as the exhaust to the outside. You just want to make sure, uh, especially in the fall, leaves may blow up on the screen and, and block that, which uh, reduces airflow. Uh, so that's just another thing. But besides that, there's really no maintenance on the actual system itself. Operationally then, um, this graphic is uh, kind of showing you all the different modes of operation that are possible. And then on the right side are the configurations, <clears throat> both in recirculation as well as ventilation in heating or cooling. As I mentioned, the serve uses a small heat pump to do the energy recovery. Uh, this allows us to actively add heat or cool and dehumidify fresh air before supplying it into the house, hopefully in a conditioned state as much as it can. And then because we are measuring the air quality, uh, that the serve doesn't always have to be in ventilation mode. It can either sit off or it has a recirculation mode to help mix the air throughout the house. This does extra filtration, which is very important. But we can also use that same heat pump to add a little bit of heating or cooling dehumidification uh, directly in the home as well. The heat pump is roughly a third of a ton, uh, really sized for the airflow uh, for the ventilation needs about 100 to 300 CFM. So it's generally not enough to fully condition a house, uh, even with smaller high-performance homes. Depending on the location though, time of year, um, the serve may do quite a bit of the conditioning uh, for a low load home, uh, but it's not meant to be the main conditioning system uh, in a house. If you need a lot of ventilation during extreme weather events, the serve is having to put that conditioning into the outside air, bringing up to comfort conditions. So that's not time where you're getting that direct uh, um, energy benefit necessarily inside the house when you may uh, need a lot. Um, but looking at the modes of operation, then there's research heating, ventilation heating, uh, free heating. Uh, free heating like free cooling is when the heat pump just stays off when energy recovery isn't beneficial, you just wanna bring fresh air in. Uh, swing seasons are when you might see this a lot. So um, when it's uh, cooler outside, but not quite cool enough to make the, overcome the internal heat generation in the house, 
you just want to bring that fresh air in to cool it down, provide fresh air so the heat pump will just uh, stay off during that time. Uh, recirculation cooling, recirc heat, um, ventilation cooling. Vent set point is uh, where you're close enough to the set points and conditions outside are uh, not really enough to uh, justify doing energy recovery. Again, you can just uh, bring in that fresh air uh, in the home to reduce pollutant levels. Um, recirculation mode is where the serve would otherwise just be sitting off kind of in standby mode if the air quality and temperature settings are satisfied that the inside fan can come on just to move air through the house uh, just to even out the air quality comfort uh, do extra filtration so uh, a lot of homes will just set that at 100 percent so then the serve is never fully uh, shutting off it, that inside fan is uh, always just going to maintain air movement through the house especially homes that are using the uh, mini split uh, heat pumps. Uh, this can kind of help uh, move air around the house as well for those. And an off assess is where um, the serve is uh, just sitting off. Then it periodically uh, has the fans come on to move air to update uh, the readings uh, to see if it needs to make an adjustment as far as um, either ventilation or recirculation, heating or cooling. As far as what's going on uh, to uh, give us these different modes of operation, uh, the heat pump itself then has a reversing valve, so we can switch that. That's what's doing, uh, switching between heating or cooling. And then there's a damper mechanism built in that's uh, switching between the recirculation uh, versus the uh, fresh air ventilation modes. Uh, so that's kind of what this uh, schematic is uh, trying to show here. A question I get a lot um, from people after they've just installed the serve and are still learning about it is um, why is it still bringing air from the outside even though I'm in recirculation mode? And so the heat pump is built all in into one box as opposed to like your air conditioner or a mini split heat pump that has an indoor and an outdoor unit. Uh, so when you're in heating mode uh, with like a mini split, uh, there's air moving on over the outdoor unit but because our outdoor unit is built inside of the same box, we need to bring fresh air in uh, over that side of the heat pump as well, even if it's in recirculation mode and we're not introducing fresh air into the house, we are bringing that air over uh, the heat pump and then exhausting it back to the outside. <clears throat> so in each case, it's uh, bringing fresh air into the serve itself, except for the uh, recirculation mode when just the inside uh, fan is operating. The uh, sensors then are monitoring uh, indoor air quality. So we have independent CO2 and VOC sensors. As I uh, mentioned, these are all built uh, into the serve itself. So wherever the serve may be located uh, in the house, uh, it's just all the ducts coming from the house, bringing air back to the serve it's measuring that uh, that air. And then it's measuring also temperature and relative humidity, both inside and outside the house. Uh, SERV2 has uh, capability to add a CO2 or VOC sensor uh, to the fresh air as well. We're still working on the control mechanism for that, uh, but this is an option that uh, people can use just to see what the outdoor air quality may be. Uh, places where the wildfires are prevalent. Uh, this lets them perhaps change the modes of operation or settings with their unit, as well as look at um, installing uh, specialized filters for removing smoke particulates and odor. So uh, they may use uh, charcoal filters during uh, this time uh, when wildfires are a problem, but just any concern with the outdoors or just knowing what the outdoor levels are, we have this capability. Uh, future development internally for us is using this outdoor uh, knowledge to make adjustments automatically in the uh, serves operation, but that's still something we're uh, looking at uh, doing. The controller then, this is the, the main screen uh, down below. As I said, the inside and outside temperature and relative humidity are uh, measured. Uh, those are the uh, uh, 
the under the house icon with those arrows. Uh, that's the inside uh, house uh, temperature and relative humidity. The uh, one that it's not a true outdoor. Uh, there's going to be an offset depending on uh, how long of a duct run from outside to the serve there is, how well insulated that is. Uh, so a more accurate description of this is the fresh air inlet to the serve uh, temperature and relative humidity. So in the wintertime, the air may be warming up a little bit as it's coming through that duct, so it won't be a true outdoor uh, reading. We also have a ground loop heat exchanger that can be used to uh, preheat or precool the air. So if that's in line, uh, that will also impact this uh, fresh air reading, so it's not going to be a true outdoor uh, measurement. Uh, next to that, under the CO2 and VOC uh, kind of clouds, you, know, you see the readings there. Uh, these are both in parts per million. So CO2 is a true parts per million, but then VOCs are generally used, um, measured in parts per billion, uh, but our sensor, we um, it's correlated to parts per million, so it can be on the same scale as CO2. Uh, it's correlated to uh, VOCs generated uh, from human respiration. So if you just had someone in a sealed room with both of these sensors, they should be tracing uh, pretty identical to each other. If you have uh, off-gassing or cleaning products or something generating additional VOCs, then you would see a, a, a VOC reading higher than uh, CO2 levels. And then below that are the status bars that indicate how far away you are from uh, the set point. Uh, green indicates you're well below, uh, yellow you're getting closer to the set point, and then red would be you're out of range and it would switch into ventilation uh, mode at that point. Uh, below that, uh, along the bottom, is the current mode of operation. So uh, that corresponds to the previous uh, slide where I showed the different modes of operation. And then um, in the upper right, just uh, it's kind of a status alert. Um, a bar there. Um, so this is kind of the main screen where you would navigate through to get to any of the other screens. As far as uh, set points then, uh, setting ventilation on the serve, uh, CO2 and VOC, uh, while they're measured independently, uh, right now we have them just sharing the same set point, uh, generally anywhere from 8, 900 to 1,000, 1,100 is kind of the range you would maybe set this to maintain uh, air quality below seven, 800 parts per million in the house. Um, CO2 VOC sensors uh, can also be uh, disabled independently. Uh, so where there may be a high source outside of VOCs um, that would make it appear that inside has high VOC levels if you continue to ventilate, this just lets you disable a sensor for certain reasons or times um, so then the serve won't be uh, kind of falsely ventilating due to something going on outside. And this is, again, something we're working on with the uh, fresh air, air quality sensors that uh, these can compare to each other uh, to see, okay, is it a source from outside that's kind of tricking me that it is inside uh, or, um, or is it a true, um, do I have high VOCs inside and outdoor air is fine to bring in. In addition to setting the parts per million, um, you can also set a schedule ventilation. So if you wanted uh, just a baseline ventilation, uh, bring in fresh air uh, so, minutes, so many minutes out of every hour, no matter what the air quality readings are, uh, this is how conventional systems are operated. So you do have that uh, flexibility if you want additional fresh air for whatever reason, but 0% then just uses the sensors to dictate uh, when you're going into ventilation mode. Temperature set points, this is what the heat pump is using to both determine whether to go into heating or cooling mode when it's in ventilation, as well as then uh, when you don't need fresh air, that just recirculation, heating or cooling, if you wanted to use the serve to uh, provide as much heating or cooling as, as it's able to, uh, these settings are used these are also used to determine whether that uh, free cooling or free heating uh, mode of operation are useful as well. <clears throat> Some performance numbers for the serve, uh, and you can find these online. 
Uh, there's a lot of detail here, but um, because it is a heat pump, uh, we have uh, both the capacity, uh, COP levels, uh, input power uh, for different um, for different outdoor conditions for heating and then uh, cooling as well. Uh, so you can see at um, below freezing, uh, the serve is still close to uh, a COP of three. So it's a very uh, efficient system. Uh, so that's why people use it to do as much heating or cooling as it as it can, even though it is a smaller capacity. And then their uh, their larger systems will take over from the serve uh, as it can't keep up with that. Cooling capacity and a dehumidification, the maximum on that side of it is about uh, 10 liters per day. The, uh, the latent cooling is uh, really set um, like an air conditioner, so the dehumidification is uh, just part of its cooling function. So we can't specifically dehumidify like a uh, standalone uh, dehumidifier that's removing moisture while adding heat to the, to the house. And then the, the fans below, uh, this is just for some different uh, speeds, but quite a wide, wide range of uh, fan power depending, uh, dictated really by the ducting that's put, uh, put in the house. So uh, using good duct design, low static pressure in the ducts, you're going to have really low uh, fan power. Uh, smaller restricted ducts, the fans are going to need to ramp up to maintain whatever uh, uh, CFM you need uh, through the house. This curve is just showing the uh, first generation and the second generation uh, efficiency for uh, recirculation heating. Uh, so with uh, some small changes that we made to the uh, heat pump system, we're able to get better uh, COP performance uh, out of the unit. Um, so it was a good uh, step up in that uh, direction there. Uh, but you can see heading well below zero then uh, towards the graph to the left, as far as heating COP, uh, well below zero, we're gonna be uh, better than one, which is uh, what you would get with electric resistance, which is what the serve goes down to as you get uh, well below zero. Capacity of uh, heating then, uh, we tried to skew the serve two more towards lower uh, temperature heating capacity. Uh, sacrificing it at the upper end where you need less uh, heating when it's 40 to 50 degrees outside. Uh, so that this curve is just showing our first generation versus the serve two uh, capacity in heat mode. <clears throat> and then cooling has the same uh, um, kind of characteristics as far as the COP level uh, and then um, having a bit more capacity and cooling and dehumidification than we did previously. This is a comparison of the um, uh, airflow rate for uh, the serve versus the serve two. The uh, dotted lines are for the, the serve two versus the solid lines for the serve. This is uh, both with MERV 13 filters uh, accounted for as well. So you can see um, we've just by making changes, keeping passageways larger, simplifying passageways, um, the serve two gets uh, better airflow than our previous one. So this reduces the uh, fan power, uh, potential uh, noise, and um, uh, you can just run the fans at a lower speed for equivalent airflow uh, rates. The blue box is kind of the, um, uh, where you really want to design your ductwork for having lower static pressure. Um, trying to make, uh, have the fans run 60 to 80% fan speed uh, for normal operation uh, is a good target to shoot for. Uh, so you can see with lower static pressure there, um, 150 to 200 CFM is probably where most uh, projects would set the serve to be operating. Uh, so this is a good, um, kind of a good place to design your ductwork around. Uh, there's two uh, fan options for the serve. Uh, same heat pump, same everything else, just different fans. This is for our smaller uh, fan option. Maybe houses 1,500, 1,200 square feet and below uh, would use these just with simple, um, simple, small, uh, short duct runs. And our large fan option has a much higher uh, static pressure and airflow capability. 
so this one could take you up to 300 CFM if you need it. But again, keeping low uh, duct static pressure uh, is important to maintain a lower fan speed on average. We'll go so uh, through some features and options. Let me just check on time here so we have uh, time for questions in that. But uh, this will just go through uh, uh, the different uh, external input and output and other features that uh, the Serve 2 has. Uh, what we've gone through previously just with the settings and set points, those are kind of the basic operation. And then above that is more where you get into uh, things for spot ventilation or interacting with external uh, devices. Communication that's built into the serve. Uh, I said before that Wi-Fi is built in, so you can uh, control the serve online from a smartphone or a computer or a tablet. Um, there's no uh, service fee associated with using uh, connecting your serve to the internet. Uh, it's completely free as long as you have internet uh, connection. Um, and then uh, service is the kind of dashboard that you use to uh, to log in and uh, control the serve. Uh, N-Ocean is also uh, built into the serve, so this is what we use to uh, talk with our wireless uh, devices. And so this is a nice low power um, communication protocol that we built in as well. And uh, as the last bullet said here that uh, we can do over the uh, over the air software updates. So um, your serve really should be getting better over time as we add new features or uh, changes to the algorithms that you can automatically uh, take advantage of those things. This is kind of that online dashboard uh, called service. So you can see the online controller is identical to what's built into the serve or uh, the optional remote touchscreen controller. Uh, so it should be uh, easy to use. Uh, that chart I showed previously uh, with the CO2 VOC levels uh, that's what you see online as well. So it's logging all the data that it's collecting. So you can uh, look at that data over time. Uh, you can download the data uh, and make use of it as you'd like. Uh, in addition to air quality, um, the temperature and uh, uh, humidity readings are also logged for, um, for inside and outside the house. And then along the right side here, these are analytics. So these are those home health reports that give feedback to the users. Uh, these are different metrics. We have another webinar called IAQ Metrics that kind of goes over what these are and how they were developed. Uh, but this really uh, gives people feedback on how their home is performing versus just ventilating to uh, code levels. And then it gives insights into uh, using VOC and CO2 readings uh, what things they should be looking out for uh, in their home, and then just over time, uh, how is it performing? Communication to the outside. Uh, Wi-Fi is obviously built in, so you have that online control. Uh, there's spaces for wired inputs, so this is where the server would detect a signal from some external device to trigger it, uh, the serve to do something. Uh, so either a 24 volt uh, signal or a dry contact can be used there. And then wired outputs, uh, this is where the serve can control something externally. Uh, again, uh, dry, normally open, normally closed contacts, as well as a 24 volt uh, AC output. And then the wireless and ocean devices are also external uh, to the serve that we can both control as well as read signals in. Built into the unit itself, there's uh, one output uh, built in, uh, dry contact, uh, normally open, normally closed. Uh, there's a 124 volt um, AC output, and then there's one uh, signal input. Um, so that would be um, built into the standard unit that you can wire to this way. We offer an expansion board that expands to three additional inputs as well as six output channels. So if you have multiple things uh, wired to it, I'll go over zone dampering later, but um, that's something that can be controlled directly through the expansion board. So the wired inputs uh, that you can uh, connect to the serve, 
these are kind of the functions. Uh, so the upper right hand uh, shows if you have the base uh, uh, input, uh, zero is uh, the one built into the serve, and then with the expansion board, three additional ones. <clears throat> uh, the modes that you can trigger based on these inputs are ventilation, heating, cooling, uh, recirculation, or a stop operation. And so these are things where maybe you have some external sensor or whatever else, and whenever that uh, sends a signal to the serve, then you can trigger the serve to uh, do something specific. Um, uh, the halt operation is something that can be used for uh, like a moisture sensor or something like that. If you detect water somewhere, you can uh, turn the serve off. Um, but these are kind of flexibility on the wired inputs that uh, you can see here. Um, the upper right then kind of shows these configured. So they have, these are configured to ventilation. So there's an external input to the serve that tells it, hey, I want to ventilate for whatever reason you may have. Likewise, the wired outputs then are the serve using its internal readings uh, and then uh, these settings are set so you can control external devices. And uh, you can see here that uh, GeoBoost is the ground loop heat exchanger. Uh, that's one that can be configured to it. Uh, the service looking then is it better to use the ground loop heat exchanger to precondition the air or just have that off to bring in fresh air uh, directly without preconditioning it. So uh, you can set this output to control um, a circulation pump uh, to do those things. Fan interlock can be used so whenever the serve is operating, if it's uh, connected to a central system air handler that you can have it um, run that fan whenever the serve needs to be on. Uh, but you can inter interlock it with uh, various devices as well. Um, heating and cooling, so if you wanted the serve to control an external heating or cooling device, we sell a post heater that can be used, an electric uh, duct heater, and the serve can be used to control that. So uh, a zero offset would use the duct heater whenever the serve is going into heating mode, or you can set an offset to where the temperature in the home would need to drop a number of degrees before it would uh, try to use that uh, duct heater. Um, ventilation, so this can be used um, to trigger something else during ventilation time or um, we've looked at some light commercial applications where on average the serve may be able to maintain the air quality in a space, uh, but like a meeting uh, house or an office building where there may be a conference that has more people in it, uh, during those times when the serve can't keep up, if it reaches a higher threshold on the uh, ventilation uh, setting, it can trigger a bigger um, ERV to come on during that time to provide additional ventilation. And then we can control uh, dehumidification or humidification. So if you're uh, above the humidity set point or below it, you can uh, trigger something to do something related to uh, humidity levels. Uh, zoning is uh, something else then to control dampers. This would be where maybe you split a house up into a large house into different segments or a multifamily and the serve can spend time in each of these uh, zones. So it would uh, open the return ducts from one zone, <coughs> return and supply ducts from a zone uh, to spend time there, and then just switch to a different zone for another period of time. So it's just kind of going back and forth between these. The wireless device options, uh, these use that N-Ocean protocol. Uh, mainly these are used for uh, triggering spot ventilation for bathrooms and kitchens. The wireless vent switches, um, these are both battery free uh, as well as uh, wireless. When you press the switch, it generates enough power to send a signal to the serve. Uh, so these are used in uh, almost all of our installations for uh, bathroom ventilation or kitchen. The active circuit transmitter uh, kind of does the same thing, but it's wired to an existing circuit, either a light or maybe a kitchen vent hood. And whenever that's turned on, it's sending a signal to the serve to start ventilating. The remote sensors we have, these um, measure temperature, humidity, CO2 levels. Um, right now you can't use those 
for the serve internally to do anything, but it can use those readings just to tell you what's going on around the house, or um, you can use those instead of this uh, sensors built into the serve to control external devices. So if the serve is activating a heater, you could have it using a temperature in the living area as opposed to the one built into the serve. And then wireless relays can be used for various uh, reasons to trigger things externally to come on uh, with the same outputs as uh, I showed before, heating, cooling, ventilation, uh, things like that. As far as remote venting specifically, uh, using like the wireless switch or the active circuit transmitter, when you configure this to the serve, um, it can tell um, each of these individually. So you can set uh, the settings for these uh, different for each one. Uh, so if you had a number of switches around the house, you can name each of them individually. They can each have a different uh, ventilation time length associated with them, as well as a different fan speed. <clears throat> And so you can uh, see here, this is just how you set those uh, different things. So if you wanted uh, the serve to boost the, the fan speed up when that switch is hit, you can do that. If you wanted it to have different speeds for different rooms for whatever reason, uh, that you have that flexibility. Zone dampers can be layered on top of the, uh, those wireless uh, switches. Uh, this lets you then specifically pull more uh, ventilation air from a location that's active. Um, so if you had um, several zones set up that, um, for instance, you could have the, when the master bathroom switch is pressed, it may close down the kitchen and the other bathrooms you have in the house to pull more air specifically from the master bathroom when that switch is active. Uh, kitchen vent hood goes in use, then you could close, it would close down the master bathroom and the other bathroom returns to pull more air from the kitchen. <clears throat> so this just, uh, again, is another layer on top of that to give more precise control for spot ventilation, uh, where maybe during normal operation, um, just the lower, uh, Airflow from those spaces may be enough just to maintain good air quality, but then for spot ventilation purposes, if you wanted to boost that airflow up, uh, then that's why you'd use the, the zone dampers. You can also add them on the supply side as well. So if a certain zone is active for ventilation, you can also have the supplies direct the airflow uh, to a certain zone in the house during that time. Um, and these zones you also set um, so you can link several to the same switch or several switches can be on one zone. So you can have multiple bathrooms on a single zone damper if they're all connected together. So it really depends on the, the house layout and how you may wanna control things. The screen here uh, just shows uh, this has a number of devices configured, uh, wireless devices to this particular serve. So this is a remote wireless controller uh, this one is a bedroom uh, sensor with uh, temperature, humidity, and CO2 level. Um, a bathroom wireless switch here. Um, this is an active circuit transmitter. And then this is a kitchen vent hood on an active circuit transmitter. So you have uh, up to 18 of these uh, types of devices linked to the serve. And then down below here, this, this is uh, then that device just showing that uh, the vent length, the fan speed, and then what zone it's been uh, configured to there. So this is kind of the, the status of that particular uh, device. Just some things we're working on in the hopefully more near-term future. Uh, for the SERV 2, we don't quite have um, the, duck, uh, the mini split controller out yet, but that's something we hope to release uh, here shortly. Uh, and then uh, with all the smart home integration, uh, we've been taking a look at that as well. So connecting to things like Alexa or uh, Google or Apple Home uh, type products, uh, having that integration in with the voice control as well. The Surf 2 has been out uh, roughly about a year. In October is when we uh, receive UL listing. Uh, this is both US as well as Canadian uh, UL listing. So 
now we're in full production and uh, shipping UL listed um, uh, products all across uh, North America. And then just some ways to stay uh, informed and up to date with what we're doing. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter. Our next one should be coming out here um, soon uh, for February. Uh, we announce webinars through there and have other informative articles, uh, spotlights of different projects. And then under news, you can see past uh, newsletter articles, archive webinars. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, IAQ metrics webinar kind of discusses um, those reports that are generated with the data uh, taken by the CERV and uh, kind of goes through those analytics. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, tuning in. If you have any questions, um, I'm going to get to those shortly and just see if uh, there's any that I can answer here. Uh, but for sure, uh, feel free to contact us at uh, any time. Thanks.